So, welcome to this program. Um, um, intriguing topic, if I may say so. And um, I'm sure most of you are wondering what it's about. Maybe you have different uh, um, ideas about what it's about. But I won't stand between you and the speaker for long. Um, I'll just say that this talk is going to be for about 40 minutes, after which you can have an interaction session. You can ask questions to Professor Roland Vitya. But right now, I'm going to ask Professor Nagarajan, faculty in charge of the Heritage Center, to come and give a brief introduction. Good evening. Uh, our speaker today is Dr. Roland Vitier. He is Associate Professor of um, History of Science and Technology at the Indian Institute of Technology, Madras. He has studied the physics and history of science at the University of Oldenburg, Germany. He completed his dissertation on the history of acoustics and nuclear physics in interwar Norway at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology in Trondheim in 2003. Before joining IIT Madras, he taught history of science at the University of Regensburg, Germany. Roland was Vice President of Universium, a European Association for Academic Heritage from 2011 to 2017, and continues to chair the Universium Working Group on Recent Scientific Heritage. His research interests include history of the physical sciences and engineering in the 19th and 20th century, scientific instruments, university collections, scientific practice, and scientific and technical education. His publications include The Age of Electroacoustics, Transforming Science and Sound, and Learning by Doing, Instruments and Experiments in the History of Science Teaching. He currently works on Indo-German collaboration in setting up, um, I think that sentence is not. Yeah, yeah, set, setting up IIT Madras, basically the project here. Okay, yeah, so he's, sorry, um, there was some. so the project that he's currently working on is the Indian Indo-German collaboration that was involved in setting up IIT Madras between the years of 1959 and 1974. I want to add that I've been interacting with Roland now for a couple of years, and uh, I think he has truly brought a passion to this whole area of uh, preserving IIT Madras's heritage and archiving IIT Madras. I understand from him that we are already overdue compared to German institutions. You know, we've been around for 60 years. This is our Diamond Jubilee year, and he's shocked that we don't have an archive yet. So I think that will get uh, fixed very, very quickly. Switch this on. Usually I don't need a microphone, but uh, I think for the sake of uh, recording uh, this, uh, this talk here, uh, I will switch it on. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kumaran, and also uh, very much, uh, thank you very much, Professor Nagarajan. Uh, you have really been great uh, to work together with and putting up this uh, presentation. Uh, so in this presentation here, there's going to be a little bit about the history of IIT Madras, but uh, we're actually planning a different uh, talk on, I think, 1st of March now, on, yeah, 1st of March on the Heritage Day, where I will talk uh, more about the history of the Indo-German collaboration and also about the archive of material in Germany. As I said, yes, in Germany there are a lot of archives. Um, but this year will really be about uh, discussing the archive. I try to bring in some more drive. Obviously, the image of archives in India is terrible. And if you've ever tried to use an Indian archive, you know why. Because they're dusty uh, uh, institutions, uh, very old-fashioned and very difficult to get access to. And obviously, we want to change that. We want to do something that, we want to have something that is very approachable. And also, we want to take you with us in setting up the archive because the archives really lives like the heritage center of the participation of the people, right? So in many ways, it's your archive, right? It's really the archive of IIT Madras because it's an important part of the heritage of IIT Madras. Um, so yes, please, after my presentations, please come and discuss this. Also, critically, be very critical about our proposal. We've worked on this together with Kumaran for almost two years now. So we have started uh, our survey in early 2017. It has been great to work with Kumaran, it has been, and I couldn't have done it without him, but it was also great to have the support of Professor Nagarajan back then as Dean of International Alumni Relations. Now he is the faculty advisor of the Heritage Center. Uh, Mat Professor Mahesh has taken over and he is also, again, he is more new to this field, but he's also very enthusiastic of taking this further. So Professor Mahesh, who is now the new uh, Dean of uh, International and Alumni Relations, I would also like to thank uh, Mamata, who's She's out, yeah, now. But she's also great. I mean, the, the Heritage Center has just been a great place to come there and uh, to discuss uh, uh, this, right? Like, to uh, as a very energetic place to discuss this, uh, how we should set up the archive. So first, I want to explain to you why I think 
IIT Madras, and not only I, every historian would say, you're crazy not having an archive, right? So my wife, John V. Palke, who is currently setting up a science gallery Bengaluru in Bangalore, uh, who some of you know, uh, she's also a historian of science. She did her PhD at Georgia Tech in Atlanta, where I think many of the faculty, or several of the faculty of IIT Madras did their PhD. For, for example, Professor Shriram, who's been the Dean International, has his PhD from, uh, from Georgia Tech. So he, she did a PhD on history of science in Georgia Tech. What did she work on? She worked on the history of nuclear physics in India, from pre to post-independence. Her supervisor, John Creek, Professor John Creek, who's a very eminent historian of science, made it very, very clear to you. You have to find archival material. There's no archive, there is no history. You cannot write this history without archives, right? So then, she was very lucky because she was able to write her PhD because thanks to TIFR in Bombay and also the Indian Institute of Science, just at that moment started to organize the archives. So she could actually access the archives. But also thanks to a lot of American and European archives. And this is also a experience that many Indian historians have. In order to write Indian history, they go to Europe, they go to America to use the archives, right? So in Europe or the US, this would be an unthinkable situation. Imagine MIT not having an archive, Oxford University not having an archive, German universities not having archives. Doesn't happen, right? Like this just is not, it's part of the infrastructure of a university to have, right? And there are laws about this, there are archive schools where archivists are trained who get into this, right? So um, what we have is a situation where history of science and technology in India is largely written from European and American archives. For example, if you write, this is why colonial history is a very popular topic because people get very generous grants to go to London, to go to the British Library, and they write, uh, they write uh, um, uh, Indian history of science and technology from the view of the British East India Company, right? This might as well happen with IIT Madras if you don't have an archive. As you, most of you know, but maybe not all of you, IIT Madras was set up as an Indo-German... Ah, now we have to find out whether this works or not. Oh, this is what happens with this technology. As an Indo-German collaboration, right? Like here we have a great photo. I love this very much. This is uh, Walter Scheel, who was then uh, Minister of Economic Cooperation, but he was also later a German president, and there's a long history of German presidents visiting IIT Madras from the first German president of West Germany, of the West German Republic, uh, Theodor Heuss, who actually came in 1960, very early on to last year when we had uh, Frank-Walter Frank Steinmeier, the last president of Germany, visiting the IIT Research Park. There's a very long history of that. We have Bonn Avenue and uh, Delhi Avenue here, and this Professor Sengupto, who was uh, the first uh, rector of uh, uh, the first director of IIT uh, Madras. So, uh, I will talk on the Indo-German history of IIT Madras on 1st March, so I won't go into the details here. But I went to the German archives in the last two summers. I went to Germany. I even I had a sabbatical to go there to study them. And what I found was an incredible amount of historical material on IIT Madras. There's so much material on IIT Madras, you won't believe it, on the first professors, on the administration, on the German side when they organized this. Material from the German consulate here, right? So I found material from the German consulate in Chennai about setting up IIT Madras in uh, the archives of the Foreign Office of Germany. There is a lot of ar uh, material in the archives of the Ministry of Economic Cooperation and Development. And there's also a lot of material in university archives. So if you go to the Technical University of Berlin, you fin find large holdings on the collaboration with IIT Madras because they were part of the mentorate of the universities to set up IIT Madras. So yes, in Germany you always have. I also went to the RWTH Aachen, to the Technical University of Aachen. There are some others I haven't been to, but there is so many things you can find in Germany. Then I also participated in a conference in September at the Humboldt University in Berlin, which was about India in German archives. We are so fortunate now, we don't have to go to the British archives anymore to write Indian history. You can use German archives, right? But do we really want to do that, right? And already from consulting, the German archives, yeah, they're great, right? I love these German archives and I will use them in my history writing, but already from what I've seen, I don't want to only use German archives to do this because only, 
uh, obviously they only give us the German side of the story. They don't give us the Indian side of the German uh, story, right? So, uh, yeah, so uh, this is why uh, uh, we really need to do this. I also want to say a little bit about myself, why I feel qualified to do this. Uh, apart from being a historian of science and technology, I've also been working in an archive, in the Norwegian State Archive, archiving uh, or with the, with the uh, archive of the Norwegian University of Science and Technology, NTNU, where I did my PhD, which is also one of the, uh, uh, there's a lot of collaboration with NTNU and IIT Madras as well, also technical university. So I've been working in their archive and I've also been collecting, I've been working with scientific instruments collections, historical collections, and I have been vice president of uh, Universeum and I'm still sharing their working group on recent heritage of science. And uh, I can tell you like IIT Madras, which uh, started uh, in 1959, that is all considered recent heritage of science, right? Like so a history where the actress is still alive, that's usually what you call contemporary heritage or recent heritage, right? So uh, this is what we're really doing and we've been discussing a lot these kind of issues, how to preserve the history, the heritage, uh, of science of the last, uh, I don't know, 50, 60 years, right? Um, at IIT Madras, we are very lucky to have the Heritage Center. So all of you know the Heritage Center, I hope, uh, where we have collections of photos, uh, reports, uh, uh, publications related to the history of IIT. They're, they conducted a lot of uh, oral history interviews with former faculty and alumni. I just learned there was one today, one interview, and I'm very, very happy about that. But most importantly, they create a public space to experience the history of IIT Madras for you and me to come, to meet and talk to people, to organize public talks like mine here, and to have a web presence. We shouldn't forget, but to, because today, obviously, if you're not on the web, you don't exist. So they created a website, a web presence. They scanned all the photos. They're accessible on the internet. But I can tell you the Heritage Center is not a substitute for an archive, right? Oral history interview, interviews are very important. And all eminent universities now will have their own oral history programs to conduct oral history interviews with faculty. But, uh, I, and I don't want to go uh, too much uh, into the detail here, uh, I mean it's a little bit like doing science. I mean doing history is a little bit like doing science. It's an empirical activity. If you don't have sources, you cannot write history. And we have a lot of that problems. You just had a discussion in India with the Indian Science Congress. A lot of history of science and technology in India is pure speculation, right? It's not based on empirical evidence. And oral history is great. It's one source of empirical evidence. Obviously, we can only do it with people who are uh, with from periods where people are still alive. But it's also, a, by definition, a subjective source, right? If you have two people experiencing something, you interview them about something, you will get two different kinds of stories. Which is great. I mean, it's great as a historian, but you also need other kinds of sources. So the idea of writing history is really have different kinds of sources, having material evidence, having archives, having oral history, having photos, and bring all these together. If they all talk the same language, right, then you have a very good story. Right? It's almost like going to court, right? Like, if you want to have a very good court case for your history, you have to have very, very serious evidence. Okay. So that as a quick uh, introduction. So where do we stand? In, this, in the year of its 60th anniversary, IIT Madras does not have an archive, and we obviously want to change that. All important scientific insti institutes need historical archives. If there is no archive, we really have problems. Uh, it's probably not no history, but it's much more, much more difficult, right? Uh, other major scientific institutions in India have created their archives. And I've mentioned some here. I just want to point out I didn't talk about NCBS Bangalore is a place. Venkat uh, Srinivasan, who is now involved in our project as well, has done a great job. And they just opened their archives uh, these days. Uh, uh, math Science has archives, much smaller archive. But Math Science, right, has already surpassed. It's about as, as old as IIT Madras, obviously a much smaller institution. And we have also been there. Kumar and I have been there and looked what they have been doing for their archives. Uh, so we conducted a preliminary survey of archival material uh, throughout uh, 2017 to see what's there. And what we really found, uh, large amounts of rich archival material at IIT Madras. But what we also found is that a lot of it is very vulnerable and need for conservation. And obviously it's also not accessible, right? Like if you want to find something, it's not possible. 
to find things, or it's difficult to find things. Where it is possible, so I just wanted to show you some of the selected findings. So this year is really a charge with the list of Indo-German partnerships in 1972, right? Like, so there's really, they have like a lot of reports, a lot of correspondence. So this office of the director, this archive, you can say, of the office of the director is a very nice source. source. It's well organized. They have a filing system. Uh, the point is, uh, Ms. Reveti, who is uh, there in charge of the office of the director, will tell you they don't really know what to do with this, right? There's also, from the first years, it's kind of lacking, and they just have stored it away in some cupboards, and there's also some problem with uh, silverfish and some other uh, 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 conservation uh, issues here. But this is uh, certainly a very well, already very well organized part. And uh, so if you really do archiving of an institution like IIT Madras, you will just follow the organizational structure of the institution. So obviously, we'll go to the office of the director and ask, what do you have on files of your history, right? Uh, the registrar's uh, office, this is Mr. Tamil Selvan, who was a great help, a great resource in doing this kind of thing. And also, the registrar has been very helpful in doing this. And this is just one of the cupboards uh, we found there. And this is, for example, a, a document, uh, a great document. This is the meeting of the planning committee, this invitation of the meeting of the first meeting of the planning committee of the Southern, how IIT Madras was not always called IIT Madras. Back then, they called it the Southern Higher Technological Institute in 1958. So there are some documents from the very beginning. In the German documents, you can even go to, back to 1956, even before the meeting between Nehru and Adenauer when the setting up of the IIT was actually discussed. There's even documents from before that. Uh, if you go to the engineering section, we found a lot of very nice material. This is a little bit newer. This is uh, plans, for example. This is a plan for setting up uh, the research park, right? So this is from the research park, uh, obviously much newer. And I'm not saying we should only, so it's kind of not only the, the, the very oldest material, but also newer material of IIT Madras. Uh, what happened now? Yeah. Here we even have a model, an architectural model. You might remember, uh, John, John, I think this is where you're living, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think this is a model of, uh, of some of the uh, residential housing here, right? Architectural model that they have. And this is a plan from, I think, 1962. A very nice plan, a drawn plan. But we also have all, we have all the old architectural drawings. So we have the drawings all the way back to the beginning of IIT Madras from the 60s, right? So this is also 1962, and you might recognize this here is uh, the Humanities and Sciences Building. This is the large lecture hall, right, where you come in, the Central Lecture Theater. So very nice drawing uh, uh, that was made in, in the 60s. There's large amounts of material, right? This is, I just got there, and I thought, oh, what to do with this, right? You just take the, uh, the wrench, right, and you start measuring, and you say, oh, this is three times five meters by two times five meters, 2.5 meters by 1.5 meters paper, right? So this is mainly, what is this here? This is mainly tender documents in the engineering section, right? Like, so they, they have these tender documents when they ask for, uh, 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 for um, uh, when, when they try to build new buildings and they just stock them up here, right? And obviously these are not accessible. You just really have to go through it and a lot of it might not end up in the actual archive at the end, right? Like especially tenders of buildings that were not accepted, that were not taken, it's probably not necessary. And even the ones that were taken, we might sort out some stuff, right? But this is some material, you just can't just throw it away before you just check what this really is. So this is uh, in, the, in, in some rooms on the second floor of, first or second floor of the community hall, where we found loads of material from the engineering section, where they just basically dumped all their old paper. Uh, so the largest storage room, this is Kumaran, just standing here, which we found took us some time. And uh, when we wanted to uh, access it, people told us, oh, we first have to check for snakes and scorpions. We found some cat has moved in there, so there was some <coughs> cat poo there uh, when we went there last time. Uh, but this is really about 120 steel cupboards filled with paper on 1,500 square feet. So we cannot say, when we started this project, people told us, oh, there's probably nothing left, right? When you go there, and this is even, if you think of an institution like IIT in India, which is very bureaucratic, like you have to fi sign five papers to buy a pencil, right? They produce a lot of paper. And obviously a lot of these papers, you probably don't want to keep all the papers from buying pencils, right? Uh, might be thrown away. But we see there's lots of material here. Here, for example, there's lots of material. Uh, there's a file from every student 
So you who, who have studied here in the 60s, IIT still has a file on you, right? But obviously we cannot just make them accessible to everybody. So we really need an archive, a structured archive, because there are some personal rights, right? So maybe there are some evaluations of you which you don't want to be publicly known, right? Like we just discussed in uh, uh, some cases medical files, for example. We cannot make medical files of people who are still alive just publicly available. So this is why we need an archive, right? We, we don't want to throw away these things, or at least we need a plan, what we want to keep and what we want to throw away. But we also need a plan for access, right? What can be pub, uh, publicly accessed or which stuff has restricted access, right? So, uh, so there's lots of material, lots of paper here, but there's a lot of issues also, right? So this is actually mold. Right? So you see these kind of papers and you see they're kind of eaten up already. So this is already in preco uh, precarious uh, state. And obviously you say, okay, you have to do maybe some fumigation or some other techniques to get rid of the bacteria and the animals. And you will need climate control storage for this in Chennai, obviously. Right? And then again, you want to say, okay, how much paper do we really want to keep for... Um, uh, for uh, an institution like IIT Madras, do we really need all the information that's stored in the student files or not? But these kind of decisions have to be taken, right? This is really one of the worst examples. This is termites, right? Termites in the, this is fresh term termites in the storage room. And we had like some heaps of student files where you open the student file and you see the termites eating the student files, right? <laughs> Seem to like them a lot. <laughs> uh, but these are some of the issues, right, we are facing. So we have a lot of material here. We found very rich archival material, right? There's lots of archival material. Much of the material is already damaged and needs conservation. It's vulnerable and it's also not accessible, right? It's not organized in any way. This is obviously only the tip of the iceberg. We've only been through the administration. So if you go to the departments and approach individual researchers, we'll find much more material, which is in many ways complementary, right? So this is like the meeting protocols. This is like from the top. And if you wanted to have low or more like the daily activities in the departments, you would probably find that in department documents. And then we can also approach individual researchers. We will find more material, uh, 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 which is not from the administration directly. That So the archiving should be carried out in conjunction with the oral history initiatives and the scanning of historical photographs by the Heritage Center. And the interviewers should also be asked, like you should... The, 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 the alumni and the, uh, and the, uh, uh, the, the retired faculty, whether they have documents, whether they have personal papers, and whether they want to give them to the archive. Right? This should also become uh, part of the archive. So then uh, what we did, we, create, we did an archive workshop pretty much uh, a little bit less than a year ago. You see this is moving slowly, but we all have other things to do as well. And it's better that it's moving slowly and it's moving than rather rushing things. Right? So we had, uh, for the archive workshop, we had a whole day archive workshop, which we decided not to make public, what to in discuss internally. So we really got the best people you can get in India. And we made a point also to get people from India. We don't need to fly anybody in from Europe. But India Chaudhuri, who is now teaching at Shrishti in Bangalore, and she was really the one who put the TFR archives together in Bombay. So she's been very ma in many ways pioneering the efforts of uh, scientific archives in India. Saumitri Raganathan, who was formerly at the Indian Institute of Science Archives in Bangalore. Deepti, uh, uh, who has been, who is running actually uh, an archive uh, uh, consulting services in Bombay. And she was at the, at the Tata Central Archives. So she's also from Bombay, very, uh, very eminent uh, archivist in India. Venkat Srinivasan, who is really running this NCBS archives in Bangalore. She's been very, very good and very energetic in setting up. He's been very good also with working students, working with students in the archives. So he used a lot of students, uh, uh, interns, for example, and uh, creating public events around the archives. And Sunda, who is uh, the director of the Roger Mutia Research Library in Chennai. And Sunda is, al Sunda is also a great resource because he's running an archive already in Chenna climate conditions, and he can talk a lot about uh, uh, especially the conservation issues that arise here and what would be best practices of archiving in a climate like, uh, 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 like Chennai. So with that, we started to form a proposal for the historical archive of IIT Madras, right? based on the survey and 
based on uh, the archive uh, workshop. I had some ideas about this before, but we also we really wanted to get the experts in presenting them to them what we found and how should we get along with that. So we, we said, very similar to what Venkat has done at uh, NCBS, we said we need a project phase for three years where we start hiring uh, a team leader and this, in this pro pro project, force, uh, uh, project phase, we want to set up the archive as a permanent unit. Um, yeah. So the archive project will then prepare this establishment and then it should become a permanent unit. And then the idea is that the archive project, as we discussed it now, uh, should be formally inaugurated at, at the celebrations of the 60th anniversary of uh, IIT Madras on 31st of July uh, 2019. That's a very ambitious goal because we have to have something in place by then. Uh, then the completed historical archives as a permanent setup, including storage facilities, reading room, will then open to the public in 2022. So that's the timeline. It might be kind of a very long timeline, but in archive terms, it is totally not. When I went to work in Trondheim at the archives of NTNU, my boss told me, this project, I will be retired before this project is finished. This project is scheduled to archive all this material for 20 years, right? So these are really not, not uh, no, this is no time in, if you talk about in uh, archival time, right? So the organization of the archive project from, so I'm talking not about the permanent archive, but the archive project we are talking about now. So from 2019 to 2022, uh, we established a planning uh, committee for the historical archives. Uh, Professor Koshi as Dean Admin, Professor Mahesh as Dean International Alumni Relations, Professor Nagarajan as uh, obviously a veteran for these kind of things, and also the faculty advisor for the Heritage Center, Professor Sriram, who is also very knowledgeable, just gave a talk here about the history of the campus, and also we started to involve him already in the beginning when we set up the project. Uh, uh, Gun uh, Sunda, uh, uh, Mr. Sunda, uh, who's also like kind of very close, and Venkat also uh, as as member of the committee, and then Kumaran, who is the secretary of the committee, and myself as chair of the committee, and also it's planned that I'll be the faculty advisor for the archive, right? As a structure that uh, how this would work. So then we plan to hire a project leader for the archive within the next few months, the next two months, right? Uh, so two assistants then should be hired later, and we just applied for, I think tomorrow is the meeting, meeting, right, like the Dean's uh, committee meeting. Uh, we applied for some seed money for this, but obviously we won't get, so I haven't writ written down any budget numbers here, but we have kind of made some calculations. If we really want to have state-of-the-art um, climate control archive, we're talking about like two crore here. So that's what we're talking about for setting up and for also the salary of these people for the next... Uh, three years. So that we plan to really do fundraising uh, from alumni funds. I think we've started already trying to do. I don't know, uh, Nagarajan, you will be able to say more about that and the prospects of that. Um, so we also have said, okay, uh, the archive project will start its operation from the premises of the Heritage Center. Uh, but that doesn't mean that it's going to become part of the Heritage Center. I have to say that there is a, many good reasons why it should not be become part of the Heritage Center. But we also we have taken up the discussion, but it would be very rushed right now to say that's also the conclusion we have been coming, whether it's supposed to be part of uh, uh, central administration, whether it's supposed to become part of the library or however the structure will be. But that then a decision will have to be taken uh, also. Uh, but I think it will have a very close relationship with the Heritage Center, especially when it comes to public relations. If you think about a reading room, for example, and also making exhibitions using material from the archive. Uh, so yes, what we need is really a structured survey of archive material at IIT Madras, much more structured than what we are doing. We were kind of like diving, just diving into the material, right? And uh, uh, this year has to be much more structured. And then we need two very important documents that every archive needs. And that's an archive plan and an archive policy. That is deciding both what is going to be collected and how it is going to be collected, but it also decides issues of access, for example, like access to material already talked about. So some of the archive material which we will keep in the archive will probably be confidential, right? Or it will be regulated through 
that we will ask you before we make your files uh, available to others, right? Uh, uh, so these are the, the archive plan and the archive policy. They're kind of longer documents. And usually how you draft them is you take existing plans and policy, you kind of adopt them to your own needs. Then we have to assess immediate needs for protection and preservation of archive material. Uh, then plan the physical premises, the historical archive, right? So this is all what the archive uh, project is supposed to do, create a web presence of the archive and negotiate public relations, right? So just to be concluding my talk, I probably you are already, uh, I don't know what your attention span is, but I don't want to take this uh, too far. Uh, uh, so it's very clear to have a vision for what this archive should be, right? So in addition to the records of the central administration and the academic departments and centers, the IIT Madras Historical Archive will collect personal papers of professors and other key actors at IIT Madras. This will be done in collaboration with the oral history interviews that are already conducted by the IIT Madras Heritage Center. Together, administrative records, departmental records, oral history and personal papers will facilitate a comprehensive history of science and technology as well as institutional history of IIT Madras. And you can even think further, right? Like if you think about some people have already talked about a museum and what do we do with objects, right? Like what do we do of the material heritage? But this, this, the, the central administrative archive is just a very important part that's really in the center of this kind of structure. Then we envision uh, uh, the historical archives at IIT Madras, not just as an administrative unit, but also as a vibrant hub that enrolls a variety of academic fields and students in research and teaching projects uh, that develops its own out outreach program. And I really see the activities, and I've seen many of the activities on Venkat in Bangalore as a kind of best practice model, how you can do these kind of things. And then archiving. Uh, should be understood not as a pro product but as a process that connects producers and users of archival records as well as a wider public. So we all supposed to be part, taking part of the archive, right? You can say many ways archiving or the archive as a community project, right? Rather than as a kind of sealed, locked away, uh, uh, dusty, um, uh, uh, dusty space, right? Uh, I know we could discuss other issues, with prof special with Professor Nagarajan. He always points out we should uh, have a digital agenda, right? Like, obviously, we live in the digital age, so what about digitizing documents? Also, more, more recent documents don't even exist in paper format, right? Since 2010, increasingly, we don't even have paper archives anymore, so we need a digital agenda no matter what. Uh, and we should uh, definitely discuss this. I would specifically thank... Uh, uh, everybody from the planning committee or other people who agreed to be on the planning committee for the historical archives for IIT Madras. So I think that's what I wanted to say and I would really, I wish we, I, I, I want, what I want to have now is really uh, your comments, your questions and uh, discussion on this. Thank you very much. So, comments, questions? Yeah, John, yeah, yeah one my colleague. I have is, uh, um, retired but still uh, living mm. former directors and deans can be encouraged to write their memoirs. Of course, oral interview project is one thing, but they can also be encouraged to write their memoirs and then probably some kind of incentives can be given from the fund here, like they can be funded or they can be invited to stay here for a month or two weeks to just refresh their yeah, memories. Uh, but in the long term, so that would be a very useful resource, yeah. memoirs by yeah. former think, deans and directors. Yeah. Yeah. I think some of them are already involved in the Heritage Center and uh, obviously at least the ones who want to be involved, they're already very active there. I think what is very true is that we should think about, like if I talked about the archives of the director, that we should definitely ask people, do you have any papers, right? Like, okay, write down your memories, but also do you have any papers? A lot of people do keep papers, right? So that we can create like paper archives uh, from directors and other people. Yeah. Obviously, what is also a story here is, and I, I don't have to discuss this with you, John, we should try to have not only ask the professors, not only the directors, but having a kind of structured survey and say, okay, who are we missing out, right? I would also have, like, let's say, an interview of one of the first cleaners. Yeah, yeah. 
course, right? yeah. Having some other people who have been here, or I mean, there's a lot of, what, what I liked very much when I went to the engineering unit, uh, they had a lot of photos on construction going on, and there were like some construction workers here, right? Like, and if you could find like one of the construction workers who was involved. So it would be very nice to have a kind of very diverse histories of the people who've been here. What I also very li much like is uh, Kumaran's way out to deal with, uh, the heritage, uh, with the heritage of, in the heritage center with the heritage of IIT Madras, which also includes like the natural heritage we're having here, right? How that would be represented. Oh, but you obviously, yeah. Oh, that's a very important point, uh, you yeah. made, like, because I've come across myself personally, people like on the campus, like I was a cook here yeah. <laughs> 30 years back, so I think that's very important. So those kind of people also should be involved. Oh wow, yeah. I didn't know that. <laughs> I learned something about John's history. I don't think many, many, uh, many professors or alumni can say that about themselves. Yeah, so. Yeah, okay. Yes? It's available in the electronic form. Yeah. And, uh, and all the student records, staff records, for the past few years, they have been digitized. Yes, yes. Both as scanned image as well as data. Yeah, yeah. So, you have to look at what is available, mm. and then look at the gaps where you want to add more into that. But I think quite a lot of information has already been digitized, and is available to be organized as required yeah. required by heritage or archive requirement. Uh, yes. Okay. As I said with Professor Nagarajan, we have discussed this a lot of times. <coughs> there is. Uh, some things to be said of this, yes, I mean, there's a lot of, and I've been using these kind of documents, especially if you think about annual reports, uh, the Compass Times and other documents that have been scanned and there are digital available on the internet. And it's a great resource if you want to work on the history of IIT Madras, especially when you're not there, right? Like you can just look into the internet, you can download the documents and work uh, with these documents. Uh, the first thing, there's a lot of the documents which we found in the survey that are not digitally available. I mean, this is like meters and meters and meters of archival material which is not available digitally. Uh, so, uh, and the same with the German archives, right? If you look at what you find in the German archives, almost nothing of that is digitally available. So the idea, oh, we have all this digitally available, there's only a small portion of what is digitally available. Uh, uh, then, uh, yes, yes, we want to digitize and we will have a digital agenda. Uh, but the thing is, you should not get rid of the original. No archivist, no professional archivist would ever recommend that. And I can give you some examples. I, as I said, it's not even from my archiving time. I started out uh, as a physicist, right? So I was working in Norway, working with wind da data off the coast of Norway. This wind data was only a few years old, but it was stored on magnetic tape. It was not accessible anymore. Lots of the data was not accessible anymore, and you will find that throughout digitization projects, which are great to make things accessible, but after some years, formats change. Standards change. And a lot of databases change, right? And it creates actually a lot of headache for people. With paper, we know very well how it, uh, how it behaves. Right? So, uh, yes, you will make digital copies, but you will always keep the original. Nobody would recommend you to get rid of the original. Uh, with respect to the new things, like the digital archives which we are creating now, the digital is actually the original. It's not the copy, it's the original, right? So in that sense, obviously, we'll not go and print out emails now, right? We don't do that. So there, we will have to find methods uh, in order to keep the, uh, uh, the digital archives. So yes, I would say yes, digitization, and a lot of the key documents should be digitized, but we still need uh, the physical archives to keep the documents. Also, uh, I mean, there, there's, there's long discussions about that by historians who would say, uh, of course, there is this argument now in the digital age, right? Like, oh, we can digitize everything, then we don't need these things anymore. Even about objects, we can they do 3D scans. But uh, usually, uh, I mean, uh, archivists, I haven't met one archivist, professional archivist, who would uh, consider this as good practice. And it has something to do with their experience with, because uh, we have had digitization projects now for a couple of decades in the archiving world. Uh, but you're right, I mean, we will need digitization, and we should really discuss this. I would recommend that in the committee that you have got, yeah. include uh, the professor in charge of uh, the computerization here. 
you will know what exactly is available, how it can be used, etc. Uh, yes. Yeah. Hmm? Someone from workflow team. Should yes, be there. Yes, yes, yes. Should yes. be there. Then. Yes. No, we, we should definitely, I mean, there need to be, I mean, I wrote down, I didn't bring the whole proposal. We said, oh, the team, right? In the team, there should be some, uh, uh, um, some qualifications, and one of them is definitely IT. We definitely need an IT specialist for uh, a lot of these kind of issues coming up. And we will really need to look deeper into this, right? It's not like saying yes, definitely it's not neither yes nor no. And uh, in, 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 our, in, in, in our days, we will, we will have to have a digital strategy, but how that gonna be uh, uh, look in, in detail, we really have to discuss with the experts. And uh, that's actually part of the archive plan and archive policy, right? What do you do? There will be a digital part for the archive plan and the archive policy. How do we do that? I mean, we already have some, as you said, like a lot of the resources, like the photographs, they're already scanned, right? And they're already available uh, online and it's great. It's a great resource. Yeah. Many this of from the uh, files you said you found in administration. Yeah. If it is only of a routine nature, like uh, saying that uh, I'm applying for this or I'm sending here an application for something. Yeah. These are all routine things. Should we have to maintain those? Look, uh, I, I can tell you, uh, I already had a master student who, uh, 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 who looked into the history of the computer center. And she actually found, so she worked with the papers. We made ex available to her, she was one of our master students, we made available for her the papers from the archive office of the director. And they're hugely rel relevant for the history of how the computer center developed. That I agree. Whenever yeah. there is some new information available, fine. Yeah. Yeah. When yeah. I say routine, see we are forwarding a paper to somebody. Yes, yes. Say I am here with forwarding the paper. For yeah. Just say routine, routine files. Now, another thing I would like to say, in your second envision, mm. this sort of a thing where some work that has been started in a department yes, yes. and that has made a name in the world yes. Yes. Not necessarily in India. Yes. Now somebody sits down and writes the history of yeah. that particular uh, subject. Yes. In fact, right this morning, yeah. we are hearing from a professor yeah. how the Department of Heat Transfer started in yeah. this institute. Yeah. And it is somebody sits down and writes how it developed yeah. right from the encouragement given by director yeah. to how the, uh, the labs got organized. Yeah. how they got projects, how they got the doctoral students, yeah. and the papers that they published and the projects that they got. Hmm. Something like that can be started even right now. Yeah. I mean, it's an encouragement hmm. for the uh, archive section hmm. and also the heritage center. Yeah. Some students coming and working. Hmm. Just like, you know, you put a, you sent a student who did something about the computer, yeah, yeah. how the computer started in IIT Madras. Yeah. That uh, girl yeah. who... I think that should be started straight away. Yeah. And at the same time, you start collecting and then material mm -hmm. which is uh, lying around mm -hmm. in, a, in a systematic way. Yeah. Look, about, yeah. and I also want to tell you, since I raised this project, I raised this question two years back. Yeah, yeah. Since then, I have got into a lot of problems. Yeah. So every time you st start trying to get a record, it is incomplete. You mentioned about the annual reports. Yeah, yeah, I can tell you the annual reports have been changed year after year. So I don't know how you can get any information yeah. from that. So, so that's why we need a professionally trained archivist, yeah. right? Like so in Germany, so an archivist in Germany, I'm not saying we have to do things the German way, obviously, but in Germany you have an archive school, right? Like people study, people come, study history, and then they go to the archive school. And then only you can call yourself an archivist. And they're very helpful, right? Like if you have a question, you write to and anybody who has ever tried to work with archives in the US, in Europe, if you have, it doesn't always happen, but a lot of times they're very helpful. You write to the archivist and they will give you a suggestion how you can find information on this. And so this really needs, I mean, when I was working in the archive at, uh, uh, in Trondheim in Norway, we threw away 80% of the paper. We threw away 80% of the paper, right? So most of this material 
will be, uh, that's also my suggestion here, or my, I mean, obviously we have to draw the plan, we have to take these tough decisions, will not be there. But we already had, so the funny thing is, was when I archived, I based my dissertation, which on nuclear physics, uh, for example, the history of nuclear physics in Norway. So I wrote about the beginnings of nuclear physics in Norway. The archive actually had an idea that all the scientific correspondence should be kept, right? Because that was very important. Whereas all the business correspondence, how we purchase things, we don't need. And I said, wait a minute, that's great for me because if you look at early particle accelerators, I wanted to know where you get the stuff from, right? And it was very difficult. If you started to build particle accelerators, it was a very difficult decision to take, right? What kind of history you can write and what history you cannot write. And sometimes you'll find out you threw something away and 20 years later you want to have it. I can tell you one of, the, one of the archives I went to in Germany was the University of Göttingen archives. And they're one of the best, really the best, uh, most professional archives, archive and library in, in Germany. And University of Göttingen, obviously very uh, eminent archives. So you know our first physics professor, Professor Werner Koch, right? Professor Koch was an alumna of Göttingen University. He was an alumna and I wanted to know, oh, he introduced these kind of teaching instruments, right? And then I saw, oh, he studied with Professor Robert Pohl. Professor Robert Pohl, who was a very eminent physicist, had lots of students. He was one of his PhD students. That explains so much for me. So I went to Göttingen, I went into the archives, and I found the proceedings of his PhD, his PhD examination, with Professor Robert Pohl, with these people, with the correspondence regarding the PhD, right? And you can say, oh, that's a routine thing just another PhD, right? And maybe it's meaningless for the University of Göttingen. For us, it's probably neat. For me, it wasn't meaningless, right? And it was kind of, it just shows me uh, the kind of uh, interesting stuff you can find in the archives, right? So where I have to say, yes, I agree with you, but we should really, what, what we really have to do, we need a kind of professionalization for that, right? So to have very well functioning archives. In fact, what I was telling you about the second thing, yeah. about it is not for a degree or anything like that. Yeah. It is to do some archival research. Mm. Because this is what uh, is being done in the Institute of Science. Mm. Something uh, in a department, a particular department, a particular area. Mm. So what has been done? Yeah. How much has it contributed to the knowledge yes. in that field in yes. the internationally? Something yes, yes. like that I'm telling you. It yeah. need not fetch a PhD, it is not for a degree. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Many of the postdoctorates are working like that. Yes, one, yes. Uh, one year, something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. That is what I meant. And yeah. that can be started right away. Yes, yes. So yes. they go to departments and they try to see yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. the literature that has come out and all that. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah. That's so what I tried to tell you. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, what I'm, what I'm really thinking, what we're having, so we have this planning committee now in place where we will discuss these kind of strategies, right? And that we will be hiring somebody. And uh, this person obviously will be crucial, right? The person, it cannot be me because I have a job already. <laughs> so this is a full-time job, hiring somebody who ideally should be a historian, right? But then we have also with Venkat, we have the experience, he doesn't have a degree in history. I, I have to say, I don't have a degree in history, right? Like I actually, I always say, I never, I never teach what I studied and I never studied what I teach. <laughs> So you can apply it on myself. And I certainly didn't have a degree when I worked in the, in the archive in Norway. But it needs definitely somebody who understands history, right? Really, and how history works. So we really need, and obviously we need somebody who can work independently and who is going to be engaged with the history to develop. I think there are many different ways how the archives can be done, right? And it's not going to be me. It's, I'm not saying I have the master plan and I just need some people to carry it out. I think what it really needs is active involvement from a community, right? And there is usually what you will see in these kind of things is like best practice models, right? So one of the things people should definitely be doing is traveling. Traveling and seeing different kind of archives and saying, this looks like a very good project or this is like worst practice, right? <laughs> we definitely don't want to do this, right? Uh, so uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this will have to happen as well, right? I'm very open. I think the most important thing is that we have a, a discourse about this. And it's also a lot of times what has happened, for example, at the Indian Institute of Science now, the last director or the previous director was very involved and he kind of pushed it very much and new director came and then the kind of whole thing, I wouldn't say collapsed, but a lot of the air went out, right? 
And also for that, I think it's, it's very important to have this on a very broad base, right? And to take also faculty, uh, students with us, right? To gain some momentum. It shouldn't be the project only of one, of one person, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, giving talks, I mean, very much what, uh, I, I mean, in many ways, and this is what I'm saying, this is probably the part what, uh, where we will be working closest with the Heritage Center, is um, uh, to, um, uh, to give presentations, but also when people write, and people already write to the Heritage Center, right? Like, we have a lot of people asking, and a lot of times you cannot answer the questions, right? Because we don't have the material at the Heritage Center right now. That's true. It becomes a participatory experience. Yeah. So that uh, people then, if somebody comes already wants to access some material, for example, that these people can facilitate it already, even though the archive is not set up yet, right? So yes, like on one hand is kind of dealing with all the public relations issues. Um, but the other one would also be involving the community, not only giving presentations. We have started at the Heritage Center, or you have started, I haven't been part of this, to have exhibitions, and we could have more of that. So we could have more of that, of the material. But we can also bring in like objects, like you've done already this model from, from the Wave uh, Energy Project, right? And you put it there, that we bring in documents, but we can also bring in objects, photography, other things. We can mix things, right? And I think one of the most important things is I already bring my students, so I teach a course this semester, Science and Technology in the 20th Century. And I always say, look, you sit in a 20th century institution. So much can be shown about how science and technology, specifically in India, developed in the 20th century by the history of this institution. Science and technology during the Cold War, look at this institution here. You can learn so much about it, so I bring them already to the Heritage Center and say, look, we can discuss this here. I have Kumaran giving a short introduction to the Heritage Center, then I talk about this. Um, but also what Venkat does is having a lot of the assistants who are working under him. It's partly also a financial constraint, but working with students, right? Like getting interns to do these kind of things. So a lot of this is going to be like organizing this archives. So you can have student interns. Do you already have student interns at the Heritage Center, right? So uh, we, can, we can do that uh, with the archive as well. So I think the worst thing is that this becomes some kind of place stored away somewhere in the administration, some basement in the administration, and uh, nobody can find the key, right? Uh, I can tell you about our archives, what was one very important uh, issue for the State Archive in Norway, and they also used the University Archive, was pension, questions of pension. Pension. Sometimes people have made pension claims, and people said, oh, we can't find the record. And they actually wrote to the archive. I mean, here, one of the best organized parts, this is already very well taken care of, and I think they know def definitely what they're doing you will find a record of everybody who has ever worked at IIT as Madras as a permanent employee. They keep records of that. Because if you have a pension claim, right? <laughs> I, I those have been done yes, yes, yes. I hope so, I hope so, yeah. Uh, but there's other things. I mean, we can mention two things that came up uh, uh, during the, the um, I think, when IIT was taken to court, right? One of them was the issues of the land papers, right? Does IIT own the land papers of uh, the papers where we're sitting on? I can tell you when I visited uh, the person who, the engineer who is responsible at the engineering section for keeping the plans and maps, she was very happy to hear what we are doing. Because they keep a set of drawings from the new buildings. They don't know what to do with the drawings from the old buildings. As an engineering section, you want to have a complete set of drawings of all your buildings. And sometimes you even want to have the historical drawings because you want to know what changes have been done, right? I would say most of uh, the, the use of this archive will be of historical nature or of alumni coming, right? Like more, you might call them hobby historians, right? Who want to find out something about that. But there is quite a few administrative uses of archives, right? Like, I mean, the history, if you look into the history of archives, archives haven't been started to be created for historical reasons, right? But more for reasons of administration. 
So there will be a lot of reasons. I mean, there will be very, very good reasons for IIT Madras administration. And we met a lot of people over there, and they're very happy. They, they see the value in what we are trying to do. They say, look, we don't have any resources, and we don't have any knowledge in doing this kind of work. Right? But we see that these records have to be preserved, not only for historical, but also for administrative purposes. Same with the student records. I think there was a decision. This was, this was a conscious decision to be taken to keep all the records of the students, that we still have all the records of all the students from the very first student. It's there. It's there. Yeah. The point is, you'll find termites there. <laughs> they are termite infested. <laughs> the termites are eating up your records. <laughs> yeah, as I said, there is uh, already an issue. I mean, look, I, uh, I can tell you one other example. I mean, I told you the example of our data not being available. We, uh, we had a very nice collection. As I said, I've worked mainly with historical collections. So we had a very nice, at the University of Regensburg, a very nice historical computer collection. And we wanted to work with the historical computer collection with our students. So we went in there. The guy who cr curated the collection, he had a database. And even though he was a computer specialist himself, he couldn't open his database because it was some years old. You'll find, if you go through the history of digital records, you find a myriad of reasons why. I mean, already with, uh, uh, so I would say digitizing and then uh, giving the rest to the termites is usually, I can assure you, I mean, with Professor Nagaraja, look, I'll give up, I'll rest my course if you get some professional archivist in here and say, we know how to do this. Right? So far, what I've seen, look, national libraries, like everybody who's really involved in these kind of things, they keep paper copies. Because with paper copies, they know what they're doing. The Roger Mutia Research Library, right? They're not digitizing everything and throwing the originals away. Digitizing is great. It's a great especially, so I think there's two things which are great for digital. One is it makes it accessible throughout the internet, so you don't have to physically come to the archive. It's very searchable, right? It's very searchable, the digital stuff. And also a lot of documents, let me say that uh, the first document, right? Like, let's say the statutes or whatever, they're very brittle paper. You don't want to give the original to the researcher. You say, look, can you work with a digital copy, right? So instead of giving them a fragile digital document that thousands of people want to read and then it just gets more destroyed, uh, you just give them the digital, right? So there is very good reasons for digitization, but uh, again, um, digitizing and throwing away the original is usually not seen. And look, I'm not a specialist on this. I'm not a specialist on this, but yes, yes, yes. And obviously we cannot, I don't think we have this specialist here, uh, but everybody I've been asking so far, I mean, look, we've been very much involved. There's a lot of, I mean, in this, group in the, in the Universeum, this European Association for Academic Heritage, where we talk about archives as well. We have a working group on digital issues, where they discuss all these kind of things. Uh, so they're really the specialists there, right? And even there, they will tell you, okay, digitization, yes, for access purposes, for all these kind of things. But at least I haven't come across anybody so far who is a professional in this field who would recommend Look, we had these things, there were like directors, like in Britain there had a lot, lot of problems like the, uh, the Science Museum in London, right? Like great institution, but now they get this kind of man managerial directors in there who don't come from the profession themselves. They, have not, they haven't been curators, right? So they come from management, they come from business. They come in and say, why do we need objects? They cost so much money. Can't we just digitize them and throw them away, right? Or sell them, like, and then the curators really start crying, right? Because they know that this is not... But it's like, if you, if you think about this, the science museum, right? Like, we just went to the science museum with my very good colleague, Santil Babu. What do we look at there? Weights and measures from South India. A collection of weights and measures from South India. If you want to understand weights and measures in South India, you have to go to the science museum to do that. And they keep them there. Right? And it's such a great collection. They have 95% of their collection as these weights and measures. They are not in the exhibition. They are in the storage. 95% of their objects are in storage. And this is why Britain is such a great place to write history, right? Yeah, because you have all these things. Yeah. yeah, but no, I haven't seen. Go to Harvard. Go to MIT. Ask them. 
<laughs> they will not. I've been working at the, at the archives in Cambridge, Oxford, MIT. None of them, none of them, none of the great institutions have done that. I have a thought, not so much in the process, yeah. but only in the scope. Yeah. You're talking about facilitating a comprehensive history of science and technology. Yeah. Basically, it's an archive of the institution. Yeah. Yes, 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 obviously, obviously, so, obviously. Yeah. So, uh, that would be an area which I think would trend uh, more of the even I like this uh, your vision talking about the skill of science and the technology. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, yeah. No, no, I totally agree with you. I totally agree with you. This is probably very selfish as a historian of science and technology, but I actually very much agree with you. And I think it's even, I think it's a very important discussion also, like the role of science and techno uh, of uh, humanities in a campus. Like, and obviously it's not, it's not uncontroversial, right? Like a lot of uh, the engineers think, oh, why do we need these uh, humanities here, right? So we need to have that. It's not even separate from the history of science and technology. Uh, yes, I totally agree with you, and I apologize we, yeah. for <laughs> this focus. We need to yeah. wind up. So, yeah. 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 Actually, it's very interesting yeah, when you switch to German language. You would even talk about Wissenschaft and not science, and that would actually include the humanities and the social science and everything. Uh, and it's just because of how the English language is used, science is usually not including the social sciences and stuff. Uh, but I totally agree with you. And I apologize for <laughs> not having them brought up. <laughs> but uh, you're totally right. right. We need to wind up here. We, we could continue the discussion after uh, the great, session is over. Discussion. So <laughs> um, thank you very much. Uh, I, I mean, I think you'll all agree that it was a most enthusiastic uh, presentation from Roland. And I must say that I've been talking with him about the, the archive, uh, the idea of an archive for IIT and um, I have not found his enthusiasm and passion flagging from one and a half years back. So I hope that we will have an archive in whatever form it is going to take, uh, not uh, too late. So thank you all for uh, your interest and for the questions and the participation. Um, on behalf of the Heritage Center, we, I would like to offer Professor Roland um, little token of our appreciation and I call upon Professor C.S. Swami who joined the institute in 1961, uh, served in the chemistry department to give him this gift. Thank you very much for your yeah. Thank you. I wish you all the luck. Thank yes, you. thank you. Another book. Uh, great. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Yes. Thank you very much for coming.